ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Corto. Ladies and gentlemen, geopolitics is a term that is often mentioned but rarely explained. Self-proclaimed experts like to talk in the media about geopolitical impact on specific geographical regions. However, I have the feeling that these people only use the term because it sounds good and they can hide their own ignorance behind it. Ignorance is an ever-increasing problem these days, especially in the field of history. Many of my and your fellow countrymen and women have enormous gaps in their knowledge and I hear I'm only talking about the history of the 20th century. History exhibits a special phenomenon with re, uh, relative regularity, which was already uh, noticed by the German philosopher Hegel. History repeats itself. In the course of it, geopolitical constellations arise again and again that bear a remarkable resemblance to events in the past. This is also what is happening now, and the similarities are striking. The inability, or probably the unwillingness, to view major historico historical events in a geopolitical context seems to me, quite frankly, deliberate. In this way, one would be able to bring to light a relatively quickly a comprehensive and detailed analysis of the circumstances that served as the actual trigger for certain events. If one were officially to have the courage to analyze, for example, uh, the Second World War on a geopolitical level, one would very quickly discover how diverse and different the interests of the individual states in Europe were. In contrast to today, when it is relatively easy to identify the actual geopolitical players who are still active, there were many more of them back then, and the interconnections were less obvious than they are today. The end result of such an analysis would be very clear. The fairy tale about the Germans, Germany's sole guilt for the Second World War would have to be revised and the glorifying narratives of the Allies as pure liberators who were only dedicated to the good cause without, of course, a hint of geopolitical interest would have to be relegated to the land of fairy tales. What has been happening in Eastern Europe and in world politics since the 24th of February 2022 is a farce. First and foremost, the USA and its proxy force, NATO and the EU, shine in their roles, claiming to have done everything right. Self-reflection is, of course, not on the agenda of these celebrities, but they do condemn all actions of the Russian Federation as an act of aggression and barbarism. A general condemnation of Russia is taking place, and this is not enough. We are seeing the Russian people in the, suppose, in the supposedly civilized times which we live in being subjected to clan liability. They are excluded from events, insulted, sometimes even attacked, and Russian products are boycotted regardless of whether they have a military relevance or are just Russian confectionery. I am not only categorically rejecting the blank condemnation of Russia and the Russian people, I do condemn it as a crime against humanity. Through my book presentations and the discussions with the guests that always follow them, I have been able to ascertain in recent weeks that people have an essential question um, that concerns them all across borders. It is, what does our future in Europe look like in the context of the war in Ukraine. Before I try to answer this question, although certainly not <clears throat> to everyone's absolute satisfaction, we must first look a little in the past history and ask who made what mistake, where and why. The important thing here is always to keep a neutral perspective. Let us first look at what the Russians can be accused of. First of all, there is a lack of communication and willingness to approach others. After the fall of the Iron Curtain, it was indeed first the Russians who were prepared to withdraw their troops from the territory of the former GDR and the Warsaw Pact countries. The Russians apparently thought they had done their duty. This was a false assumption as the political developments within Russia made increasingly clear. 
after the failed coup uh, of the communists in the Soviet Union in 1991 and the election of Boris Yeltsin as a president, there were already signs of a resurgence of communists at the parliamentary elections in 1993. The strongest force at that time was the populist party of Vladimir Zhirinovsky, and who, as an ultra-nationalist, did not give Russia's immediate neighbors a secure feeling. By 1995, the communists were once again the strongest force in Russia. This remained the case until 2003, when they were replaced by United Russia, the party of Vladimir Putin. These developments were followed with great concern by the former Soviet republics that had just regained their independence. The, con the concerns of the young republics and democracies were also monitored very closely by the USA. The rise of the communists and the simultaneous lethargy of the Russian plate into the hands of the USA to realize its interest. The fear of the former Soviet republics was skillfully exploited for its own goals and possibly even stoked up itself. It would not be the first time uh, that think tanks and NGOs were involved in such activities. Or one could say, or one could call these institutions an extension of the CIA as they are at least as good as changing political systems. With a little more skill, Russia could have ensured its own better geopolitical position here by improving the not particularly great willingness to communicate that has just been criticized. Words of apology for atrocities committed during the Soviet era, era would have been a first and important step into the right direction. This could have been consolidated through friendship treaties, the expansion of economic cooperation on an equal footing, and the recognition of territorial integrity. From this position, it would have been much more difficult for the USA to approach Russia's external borders. But now let us take a look at the USA-NATO side. That NATO's eastward expansion violates agreements made is always claimed by the Russians uh, by, the, by the Russian side and vehemently denied by the West. In fact, these verbal agreements do exist between the USA and Russia and Germany was involved in it to a certain extent. The then German Chancellor Helmut Kohl managed to anger Mikhail Gorbachev in November 1989 with his 10-point paper which was supposed to regulate matters between the two German states <clears throat> and Gorbachev accused Kohl to clearly interfere in the internal affairs of the GDR. In order to smooth the waters and appease Gorbachev with regard to the German unification process, an option was quickly sought. To this end, the former German Foreign Minister Hans-Dietrich Genscher traveled to his counterpart James Baker in the USA to discuss a strategy. At the end of the talk, Genscher appeared before the press in Washington with the following statement. We agreed that there is, there is no intention of extending the NATO defense area to the east. Incidentally, this applies not only to the GDR, which we do not want to annex, but in general. Today, people seem to be uh, of the opinion what, uh, that, was, that what has not been put down in writing has no meaning at all. Moreover, it is argued that Genscher was merely stating his own opinion, which of course was in no way binding. But none of this corresponds to the facts. What many people do not know is that the statement made by Genscher was repeated and specified by the, by the US Secretary of State, James Baker, to Gorbachev during a visit to Moscow. Or at that time, the US Ambassador Jack Matlock was also present. The latter remembered Baker's words very well as follows. You don't have to answer right away, but think about it. Assuming that NATO does not expand further east, not an inch, would it not be better for the future stability of the world, um, for Germany to be in NATO, and for America to continue to have a military presence in Europe? Gorbachev replied, any NATO expansion to the east would of course be unacceptable, but I understand what you mean and I will think about it carefully. Anyone who has used common sense 
to get to this point is bound to ask who is responsible for such a U.S. foreign policy and what drives the U.S. to pursue such a policy. In this context, the term neocons um, occasionally comes up. Who or what are these neocons? Where do they come from? And what political agenda do they pursue? I have answered these questions quite extensively in my book, and I would like to mention it here only briefly uh, for the sake of completeness. Neocon is the abbreviation for neoconservative. However, this term is exceedingly misleading because the tr in truth, the neocons have nothing in common with the classical meaning of conservatism, nor are they patriots, nor do they have any affinity with such values. If one looks at the exact origin of this ideological movement, none of this is actually surprising. The neocons are globalists, and their firm goal is to make the USA the only dominant world power and to maintain this state permanently at all costs. They are firmly convinced that the USA is capable, that only the USA is capable of bringing democracy and freedom to the world. Freedom, of course, defined and dictated by the USA. The neocons are convinced representatives of the new world order, which is, in short, aims, that, uh, aims at a unipolar world order under the undisputed political, military, and economic leadership of the USA. Interestingly, among the founders of the neocons were not too few Trotskyists, followers of the teachings of the communist mastermind Leon Trotsky, who was a strong advocate of internationalism. This in itself is a special phenomenon. Communists found a political movement dedicated of, uh, to globalism with the purpose of making the USA the sole world power, thus laying the foundations for a somewhat different capitalist-based capitalist world revolution. It may seem like a conspiracy theory, but it is more than clear that left internationalism and capitalist uh, globalism are two sides of the same coin in their orientation. Both currents are also united in their striving to put a definitive, definitive ans, uh, end to the nation-state principle and the self-determination of peoples. But what is the spiritual breeding ground for this policy? For the answer, one must delve a little into the history of geopolitics and look at the work of the Englishman Sir Holford John Mackinder. He was a geographer, economist, political scientist, and a lecturer in geography at Oxford University. In 1904, he wrote the essay, The, Geogra uh, Ge the Geographical Pivot of History, in which he presented his heartland theory, which later became part of his book, Democratic Ideals and Reality, published in 1919. He thus unintentionally uh, and unintentionally created the basis for the later neocons policy. The hardland theory divides the world surface into three main sub-areas. The world island consisting of Europe, Asia, and Africa, and this is uh, the richest and largest and most populous of all possible connections of countries. And then there are the coastal islands, which are arranged as a crescent shape around the world island, which includes the United Kingdom. And then there are the offshore islands, which are arranged in the same way around the coastal island. They include the American double continent, Australia, and Japan. At the center of all of this is the heartland. It stretches from the Volga to the Yangtze and from the Himalayas to the Arctic. The heartland is by far the most resource-rich area on Earth. Mackinder formulated his theory as a warning to his compatriots and especially to the rulers of his country that with the advance of technological development, Britain's supremacy as a maritime power would deteriorate in relation to the continental powers. Through his studies as a geographer, he was aware that any great power that was able to acquire the area he called the heartland and expanded techn technologically would sooner or later be able to extend its power and influence over the entire globe. Mackinder formulated a simple maxim for this. Who rules East Europe commands the heartland. Who rules the heartland 
commands the world island. Who rules the world island commands the world. Even before the USA entered the Second World War in 1942, the American uh, geologist Nicholas J. Spickman began to study McKinder's theory. He was a professor of international relations and taught at Yale University. One of his main concerns was to teach his students the importance of geography, because geopolitics can only really be understood with the help of geography. Spickman adapted the so-called outdated heartland theory to the needs and interests of the USA and turned it into the Rimland theory. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the basis for everything we deal with today regarding geopolitics of the United States of America. Spickman was also the brainchild of the US containment policy, which was the basis of NATO's defense strategy until the fall of the Iron Curtain. The difference with McKinder's theory is the assumption that the power of the heartland can be contained and controlled by dominating the surrounding peripheral areas, especially if the heartland fails to industrialize sufficiently. Spickman was also of the opinion that, international, uh, that isolationism, that is withdrawal into one's own hemisphere and simultaneous domination of world's oceans, could not protect the USA effectively enough. He was convinced that it was essential to prevent the USA's withdrawal from Europe after the Second World War and thus not to repeat um, the mistake of the First World War again. In his book, The Geography of Peace, published in 1944, the most important approach in his view uh, was that the balance of power in Eurasia also directly affected the security of the USA. Spickman argued that it would have been important for Germany to continue to have a strong influence in Europe after the end of the war in order to balance Russia's power in Europe. On the other hand, according to his theory, um, there was no difference between Germany having an influence as far as the Urals or Russia having an influence as far as Germany. According to Spickman, both variants were a threatening scenario for the USA. Since Germany was no longer in the condition to be in a counterweight to Russia after the war, uh, and no other power in Europe had the necessary potential to fill this role, the consequence was uh, that a legitimization had to be found in order to anchor the USA in Europe in the long term and thus to be able to secure its supremacy in the long term. Without going into the subject of NATO in detail, as I already did so last year, it was this construct that ensured that the USA had a reason to expand and justify its presence in Europe after the last war. The US was suddenly the guarantor of security for, uh, in Europe. Lord Hastings Lionel Ismay, the first Secretary General of NATO, formulated this as follows and was even convinced that his entire political career was based on this very statement. The premises was to keep the USA militarily, economically and politically permanently in Europe, the Russians out and Germany down. Spickman did not think much of European integration even then. He was convinced that a balance of powers in Europe was more advantageous for America than a unified structure. According to Spickman, the war against Germany was fought to prevent the conquest of Europe. A federalization of Europe would be against the interests of the USA. In his 1942 book, America's Strategy in World Politics, he wrote that if one had wanted a united Europe, one would only have to have to support Hitler. This proves that the European Union is only allowed to exist because it only has a superficial federalized appearance. With the, severe, uh, with the severe weakening of Europe after the Second World War and the US remaining as the so-called protective power and as a counterweight to the Soviet Union, the fate of Europe was sealed. Germany lost the war, Britain lost its empire, and Europe largely lost its sovereignty. With the founding of NATO, the USA and its transatlantic supporters took control over Europe. Zbigniew Brzezinski and many other influential uh, American politicians, such as Henry Kissinger, have been particularly influenced in, the in their work by 
the theory put forward by Nicholas J. Spickman and the considerations derived from it. The behavior of the USA over the last 80 years appears far more conclusive in the context of this theory. The constant drive eastwards into the Eurasian peripher uh, peripheries, the Rimland, far away from its territory, is rather an urge to consolidate uh, the USA's own ultimate supremacy, which can only be achieved by controlling these territories. As long as another power holds the possibilities to use the resources available there to the disadvantage of the USA, a lasting safeguarding if its own interest in this region is severely endangered. Similarly, it is in the interest of the USA if Russia remains internationally isolated and cannot effectively use its own wealth of resources to expand its own position. Russia, however, has proven Mackinder's theory in practice over the past three decades and has shown how quickly a complete rundown country can become an economic power again, which was also in the process of fully regenerating itself militarily. All this was only possible through the effective use of the available resources, increasing the level of technology of the country and the development of its own infrastructure. From the perspective of the USA, an interruption of this process was inevitable. The USA is aware that it needs Europe to shape the world and to realize its geopolitical goals. We now know that Europe's East is of immense geostrategic importance to the USA. For this reason, the US has steadily shifted its geopolitical engagement in Europe to the East in the recent years. With this shift, new supporters have also been sought and found. Meanwhile it, is only, it, meanwhile, it is on the threshold of implementing the last and most important uh, building block of its long-term geostrategic plan to control the Rimland, the integration of the Ukraine into NATO and the EU. In addition to the fear factor, the Americans rely on attributes such as hunger for power, expansionism, and an exaggerated national consciousness and an innate aggressive behavior towards Russia when selecting their new closest allies in Europe. And what a surprise, exactly such a desirable candidate is already at the Americans' back and call. In case anyone does not know yet, I'm talking about Poland. Poland is currently the most important ally for the US, USA on the European continent. Germany is only needed to a limited extent and is treated as such. In connection with arms delivery, Poland is being allowed open attempts at blackmail and threats of a bilateral, bilateral breach of contract with Germany and energy supply pipelines vital to the German economy are being blown up without consideration. It may seem like a happy coincidence for the Poles and the Norwegians that their pipeline could be put into operation only a few days after the attack. Poland is currently the only European state that actively <coughs> pursues geopolitics and thus plays perfectly into the hands of the USA by implementing its own uh, interests. It did not take much for Poland to put itself in the front line for the USA-NATO. A few security promises, a missile defense system and 10,000 US soldiers on Polish territory. What secret agreements were made, of course, are beyond our knowledge. Last year, I already reported on how new spheres of influence are forming unnoticed by Western Europeans, including Britain, and how at the same time dangerous fault lines are opening up in Eastern Europe as a result of an irresponsible geopolitics on the part of the USA and Poland. Poland imagined itself as a great power and is determined to play a central and influential role in the reorganization of Eastern Europe. Last year, I told you about the Poland, uh, Poland's efforts to revive the idea of the Intermarium, an idea that would undoubtedly have led to the outbreak of a major war if it had been implemented in the 1930s, and which is still pursuing the same geostrategic goals today as it did then, and thus has the potential to cause further tensions in Eastern Europe. In my book, I go into much more detail on this topic. Today, however, I would like to report on new and further interesting developments that will influence our future in one way or the other. <laughs>
I would like to start with a similar initiative with which Poland is trying to take a key economic position. This was launched back in 2014 and is known as the Three Seas Initiative. Initiated, how could it be otherwise, by a study of a US think tank, the Atlantic Council. It fits perfectly into the picture with, re with regard to the activities of US foundations and think tanks. The initiative consists of 13 countries, and in this case, it is also led by Poland, whose main aim is to expand its own economic influence in the Eastern European market. None of the current member countries has an economic power comparable to that of Poland in terms of the country's GDP. And indeed, why should one create an unnecessary competition within your own ranks? Since Poland is known not to shy away from confrontations with the EU, it is not too far-fetched to make the following assumption. Poland is in the process of creating a zone of influence in Eastern Europe under Polish leadership comparable to the one of the European Union. Poland, as the economically strongest country, will undoubtedly want not only to set the tone economically, but also to establish itself as a political leader. In order to, clear, to clearly underpin this claim, Poland is creating extremely disturbing facts by announcing that it will have the largest army by 2025. Largest army in Europe. All activities implemented by Poland at this time are done with the blessing of the USA and unfortunately also the United Kingdom. If we put Poland's size in relation to the current geopolitical activities, um, one could say that it would clearly describe the country as geopolitically hyperactive. If we look at Poland's history, such phases have mostly been the beginning of further confrontations. What has not been mentioned in the Western media and may also be new to some of you is the fact that Poland, in consultation with the USA, intended to invade the Western Ukraine as a security force only a few days after the 24th of February 2022. Tactically, this would certainly have been extremely effective as it would have put a stop to a possible further advance of the Russians into the Western Ukraine. It would have been extremely unlikely, especially on the basis of the facts we now know, that the Russians would have risked a, a direct confrontation with NATO. You will surely ask yourself whether Ukraine would have tolerated such an action, and the answer is almost certainly yes. Presumably, NATO would indeed have played only a secondary role here, since equally almost unnoticed by the West, Poland, Ukraine and Lithuania set up a joint brigade in 2016 that can comprise up to 4,500 men in an emergency. According to its own descriptions, this brigade is intended to take over NATO, EU and UN tasks, and of course, for the purpose of self-defense. However, it lacks a certain logic why two NATO countries are setting up a military combat unit with a non-NATO member um, country in 2016. Radoslaw Zikowski, Polish foreign minister from 2017 to 2014, revealed the plan to invade Ukraine as a protection force in an interview, in a Polish interview, in January 2023. Despite a fit of raging madness by Polish Prime Minister Morawiecki and demands to retract this, as it was of course only propaganda by the Kremlin, Zikowski did not do so. The news agency Reuters already reported in this context back in April 2022, the head of Russia's foreign intelligence, intelligence service accuses the US and Poland of planning an invasion of Western Ukraine and installing Polish peacekeepers there without a NATO mandate in the event of a Ukrainian defeat. If it if Poland has its way, there is only one solution to this conflict, and that is a victory over Russia, and preferably to break up the Russian Federation. Any halfway sane foreign and defense politician dismisses this as Poland's periodic wet dream. As much as Poland might wish for it, this fantasy will never come reality. What Poland is risking and secretly hoping for, however, is a direct NATO-US exchange of blows with Russia. The events between Poland and Belarus are also cause for concern. 
the announcement of by a Polish general that, will, that it will support anyone who speaks out against the current Belarusian president, Lukashenko, is as the legitimate head, uh, head, head of state must be seen as a clear provocation in the current situation. In Poland, it still seems to be assumed that the Ukrainian offensive, uh, counteroffensive, will be successful and those Belarusian soldiers which are currently fighting on the side of Ukraine will return armed to Belarus and rebel against Lukashenko. As, uh, and uh, the very, at the very least, the shaky general assumes that the population in Belarus will rise up enthusiastically against the uh, dictator and that Lukashenko no longer has the military potential to fight back. This is certainly a possibility and perhaps also one of the reasons why the Wagner troops are currently in Belarus. But it is far more likely that an action of deliberate destabilization of the country will not unfold something from the few returning Belarusian armed soldiers, but rather establish itself through a deliberate provocation by US, Polish, or British intelligence services. The aforementioned institutions and a large number of NGOs have been working for years on the disengagement of Belarus. The fact that this poses a serious threat to Russia in the current situation is probably one reason why tactical nuclear weapons were recently positioned in the, on the territory of Belarus, um, close to the border to Poland. This reduces the possible time for reaction on the Polish side to almost zero, and the US missile defense system could also have problems with this reduction. We all know that the US lied about its missile defense system and the reason uh, of, for its deployment. However, it has only recently become clear that they have also lied about the capability of the missile system. They claimed at the time that it could not be equipped with nuclear warheads. Now it turns out that these systems can fire land-based Tomahawk missiles. These missiles can be equipped with nuclear warheads with an explosive device of 5 to 150 kilotons. Poland is currently the proverbial ace uh, up on the neocon sleeve in the fight against Russia. And from the US strategic point of view, it is advantageous and desirable that Poland arms, uh, arm its armed, armed forces beyond a, rash, a rational level. America is supplying Poland with everything um, they want in quantities that are completely out of the ordinary. Polish Prime Minister Morawiecki said in an interview that Polish the Polish army must be so strong that it does not have to fight just because of its strength. So, in fact, it's all about intimidation, which is probably less effective with Russia than with its smaller neighbors. Is Poland, so is Poland the protective power of the East or is it preparing for the revival of the Czespospolita, the greater Poland. In Moscow, this development has already been registered and the militarization of Poland is now considered a major risk to Russia's security. The then German foreign minister Genscher once said that people who talk to each other don't shoot each other. In this conflict, however, it seems that talking, especially on the part of the West, was practiced only half-heartedly at best. Attempts to bring about a cessation of hostilities were prevented above all by the British government and Boris the Menace Johnson. He publicly stated that the Russians should not be accommodated, that Russia could be defeated, and that Ukraine would receive all the support it needed to do so. Saying this during ongoing peace negotiations is probably not the best kind of diplomacy. But this kind of arrogance Arrogance was present throughout the negotiations. Of course, the Russians are not innocent, but the West's honest willingness to communicate could have prevented a lot. At the end, uh, at the moment, the neocons and the Biden administrations are obviously not interested in a quick solution in the interest of the Ukrainian civilian population. All signs currently point to the attempt to keep Russia's military in a war of attrition. They are using the same strategy as in the Afghan war from 1979 to 1989, when America supported the Mujahideen with weapons and logistics. 
In other words, those whom they them themselves fought as terrorists, not even two decades later. There are many examples of this kind of double standard devoid of any ethical concern in recent American history, and one can be sure that the neocons had their blood-stained fingers in the execution of such activities. It does not take a geopolitical genius to guess that the dispute will not end at the negotiating table in the short term. What we don't necessarily realize, however, is that former high-ranking members of the U.S. Security Council are meeting with their Russian counterparts in the framework of the Council on Foreign Relations to discuss the current situation and ways of setting this war as, settling this war as soon as possible. Of course, these efforts are largely ignored or discredited by the official U.S. side. Since the Pentagon leaks, we know that even the U.S. military is not unanimously convinced that Ukraine will succeed in this conflict. Externally, the US seems determined to continue its material support for Ukraine, although the current situation which arises with the deselection of the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Kevin McCarthy, certainly has the potential to produce some difficulties in the supply of materials and money to the Ukraine. If one observes the events closely, one can get the impression that the government delayed the delivery of weapons even before this happened. So, it, so could it be possible that the US is trying to play for time here because strategists have already secretly resigned themselves uh, to a defeat of Ukraine? Or could it be that they want to stall, stall for time in order to build up another geopolitical player? It is at least not completely absurd to consider that they deliberately want to drag out the war in order to give po the Poles the opportunity and the, pl and the plausible reason to arm themselves. Since Russia's strategy has been to fortify its occupied territories and the front line in order to intercept the Ukraine offensive, Russians, uh, Russian, uh, Russian losses have been minimized and, as a logical consequence, the Ukrainian military, uh, the Ukraine losses have been increased. The behavior of the Ukrainian military leadership, however, cannot be understood with logic. The German and the British troops who, were, who trained the Ukrainian soldiers have also officially, officially expressed their disapproval. Ukrainian soldiers are deployed by their leaders in small units against Russian troops. That is, take two or three Leopard 2s as many M3 Bradleys and a few soldiers and the Ukrainian attack force is ready. In the end, there are burning leopards and Bradleys, Bradley wrecks, wrecks on the battlefield and more young Ukrainian men have died needlessly. German and British instructors are tearing their hair out, having been taught quite differently. Leopard and Challenger tanks are only efficient uh, and effective uh, in a larger combat formation with sufficient supporting fire. As an observer, one asks the legitimate question, what the hell is this all about? Why are the Ukrainians literally wasting material and soldiers? The American general Miley gives the Ukraine offensive another 35 to 40 days. After that, the weather will not permit any further fighting of this kind. On the other hand, we will probably have reached the limit of what is possible in terms of soldiers. It is an irrevocable fact that Russia can muster more soldiers than Ukraine. The ratio is somewhere between three and four to one. And Ukraine's back will be against the wall in about three to four months, because it will simply run out of soldiers. At this point, it becomes irrelevant how many more weapons the West can supply, as these also have to be operated by trained personnel. This would be, actually, the best time to end these hostilities at the latest and return to the negotiating table. Unfortunately, some US and NATO strategists and military leaders seem willing to take another step towards escalation. Since the Pentagon leaks, which lit up briefly like a shooting star and then disappeared into the background noise of the mass media, we know that the United Kingdom alone has 50 soldiers from the British armed forces already deployed in Ukraine. This alone violates international law and would make Britain a party to the war. 
However, if NATO countries decide to motivate their own soldiers to voluntarily exchange their uniforms for Ukraine uniforms, thus in principle overcoming the small hurdle of NATO involvement, then I don't believe that Russia could not see this as the next stage of escalation. When we talk about insecurity factors, we also have to mention Poland again. Their goal is clear, and they have already tried to provoke an incident under Article 5 of the NATO Treaty in the past when an alleged Russian missile hit Polish territory. The Polish side also claims recently that mercenaries of the Wagner Troop disguise themselves as migrants in order to enter Poland to carry out possible attacks. Officially, there is no evidence uh, of this but, however, it is obvious that the fear of the population is to be stirred up in this way, and it is purely by chance that the acting prime minister and the governing party are the ones who blow the loudest in this propaganda horn. Could this be due to the fact that elections are coming up in Poland? Poland has announced that it is ready to react to any provocations by Russia or Belarus, if necessar necessary, also preventively. This statement by Poland is another one that must be regarded as quite alarming. Lithuania, which is currently strongly influenced politically by Poland, is currently acting in, the, in a similar way. But in, rel uh, in relation to the size and the clout of the country, this seems more like a dwarf pincher trying to impress a brown bear. However, it remains questionable whether the USA is really aiming for a possible overthrow of Vladimir Putin, which would be very likely in the event of a Russian defeat. Putin is, believe it or not, the moderate factor in Russia. What comes after Putin is unclear. The danger that a real hardliner will take the helm is relatively high, and that, in turn, could have unintended consequences for the West. It should also be noted that Russia's armament efforts are currently still being carried out with a handbrake on. No more than 4% of its GDP is currently being spent on this. That is less than the investments Poland is planning. Should these figures change significantly, it would be a direct alarm signal that Russia is changing its current strategy. Russia, through its foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, recently underlined at the UN that it does not want a major war and is still ready for talks. The Western media again spoke of a mere assertion without attaching any significant meaning to it. A clear statement on the further course of the conflict is currently extremely difficult. One can only talk about possible scenarios and compare them with current developments. There are currently many possibilities. At this point, we have to say that everything is possible and the situation can change every day, as we could clearly see with the voting out of McCarthy just this week. There is still an inherent danger in this situation which could lead to an unpredictable escalation of this conflict at any time. As long as the US and its pussies continue to pour oil in the fire around the clock by sending endless military support to Ukraine, as long as the rhetoric of the West does not contain any hint of peaceful settlement of this conflict, the danger that the Russian side will see the limit of what is acceptable at a certain point is definitely given. Just a few days ago, uh, NATO reaffirmed that only the only solution to this conflict would be even more intensive support for Ukraine. In the meantime, the first US M1 tanks have arrived in, the Ukra in Ukraine. The delivery of the F-16 jets has been decided. Germany will presumably deliver the Taurus cruise missile. The UK has already delivered storm shadow missiles and holds out to the prospect of more. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, all signs are clearly pointing out to love, peace, and harmony. And all, as all this is not enough, those in charge at NATO headquarters have now completely lost their minds. The one conflict in Europe has not even been settled. The danger of escalation has by no means been averted, so they want to plunge straight into the next adventure. They are actually considering extending NATO territory to Asia.
In concrete terms, this means inviting Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. So that the announcement made in 2008 by <clears throat> George W. Bush about admitting Georgia would also become relevant again. This is nothing but an attempt by the US to position NATO in the Pacific for further interventions in preparation for the day when a confrontation with China becomes inevitable. And this is how the world's biggest warmonger and human rights violator, liar, and crook is setting the stage for an all-out world war. Peace is only possible through honest communication, common sense, actual real knowledge of foreign policy contexts and diplomatic skills. This is why we need foreign politicians like Otto Fürst von Bismarck, whose foreign policy ensured peace and stability in Europe. He was aware that peaceful and secure, and a peaceful and secure Europe could only be created in league with Russia and never ever against it. Yes, Russia is the aggressor in this case, but is it alone to blame? Certainly not. As long as the West does not show any understanding at all for the Russian view, for the Russian position, there will be no detent. Ukraine is the red line, the red line for Russia. Russia will not back down in this conflict, and if necessary, it will go the whole nine yards. That's why talking and negotiating at eye level is the only solution that will bring Europe one step closer to peace. We will only achieve this if real conservative forces that uh, the patriots of Europe and thus the true Europeans wrest power from those who want to transform our continent into a compliant, homogeneous mass, or as recently into a nuclear wasteland. We all have a duty to do everything in our power to prevent this. Just talking and complaining about situations is definitely not enough. Action is the simple but highly efficient answer. So ladies and gentlemen, let's get started. Thank you.